ideal world called Alex Oxlack Chamberlain, like a platform to develop and grow and just go one on one five, six, seven times, you know, like into a one on one situation where I think as you know, as as a German, I would say, you gotta stop it now. You gotta make sure that they understand that there's other options sometimes. Just go one on one. Ten games to go. I think they were ahead of us six points. And then we had a run like twenty seven points out of thirty, I think, in the last ten games. Like I, we we had spells where we were unbelievable unbelievable runs but overall the whole season we never unfolded to have that quality over the whole season because normally in the semi-final you've got this last gas winner or penalties where everyone like runs onto the pitch like whoa that time like we were almost like mm, it's awkward for them we almost like we felt sorry for them you know so the big hoo-ha wasn't there really you know it was it was so weird i want to begin like i do with every guest to reflect back at the early stages of their footballing journey, how did football become a passion for you at a young age? Um, I think my dad was uh, the main reason for me to actually step onto a football pitch when I was four years old. So I think he was the, an inspiration. Um, he played uh, lower leagues in Germany and was a passionate football coach. So he he was my f- first coach, basically, you know, in a small town. And um, I've got two brothers. And we all kind of started a journey in, in football or being part of that team sport. So I think it was my dad. His, uh, he was very passionate. We were a sporty family. But he um, brought us all to the green grass. And I think from there it started to unfold that this is something that we all enjoy. Um, you know, being in the team, winning and losing, all that stuff started with him. And am I right in saying he was very influential in terms of you joining Hanover as as well as a young lad? Yeah. Um, I mean, there were we were three boys, very talented, you know, that made that step to to Hanover. Let's say the Knicks, the, the the biggest club in the region of where we lived. That was twenty minutes, half an hour away. And um, yeah, that, that that was a link from one of, one of my friends who played with me. Um, his dad was actually linked to Hanover 96 and he actually had a role kind of taking care of the finance uh, department. So there was the link and we all joined at the same time. And my dad uh, joined as a coach as well. So yeah, he, he I, I wasn't really keen on moving to be fair at that stage. I think I was 12 years old. Um, I was the first experience of, let's say, a, a proper academy at that time. Um, but yeah, he probably took me, convinced me, and go with friends is always better. Was there any lessons that you learned at that young age with your dad and at the football club that stuck with you to have longevity in your career? <clears throat> yeah, I, f- I think I think the battle was always like how much football or what happened on the football club that on the football pitch do we actually take into the car and home, and you know how, how much does it was it still ongoing? I think. At some stage in my head, I was dad. I think it's it's time, you know, for you to move on. <laughs> I stay where I am, but it's 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 time. I don't want to be in that position where I feel like I'm only selected because the coach is my dad. You know that that feeling stuck with me. So I think the the biggest lessons for me, my, you know, to express, you know, what I felt. You know, it, it felt awkward at times. So I think the best thing, then, you know, he kind of transitioned me into Hanover. 13, 14, but from that time, I think it was good for him to step back and do something different. He, st- he still stayed attached to the club, which was good. He was kind of in charge of the whole youth development. But for me, it was more important that I've got a coach that, you know, is not biased or not not that he was biased because sometimes it's even tougher, you know, for for for, for a son to, to, to be to be there with, with you know, have, have the father as, as a coach. But it was a better feeling for me. So I think I learned to express when I needed something desperately to happen. Did you did you feel like you had to maybe prove a point because of that situation of your, you being the the son of Stefan and that impacting you in terms of opportunity and bias? Yeah, I think so. I, uh, the first thing was, you know, you know, my feeling with the situation was, you know, we've we got to change something. I think I, I, I recognised it. He inspired me. He was the main reason for me to be in that position. And then now it was time for me to grow on my own with a different coach. I think that was that was critical. And I think important for me to express that and my dad to feel, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's time to st- 
step away now and for me to kind of earn the next step, you know, myself and not necessarily being part of, you know, the the great partnership that we had, dad, son, you know, that, that needed to that needed to go. What was that transition like going into the first team then? Uh, obviously, reading about you, there was a fantastic disciplinary record and you got given the nickname the defensive pole. What was what was that all about and how was that important to you? I think f- from that age, I think I had a lot of reality checks, you know, in terms of being, you know, in the youth system but not really being talented enough, you know. Coaches and even my dad would say, yeah, you're not going to make it. So there were these kind of hits, you know, and bumps on the road that I experienced, you know, being being written off, being injured, having growth spurred. A lot of that actually, you know, kind of in hindsight, you know, was important for me, you know, to understand that there's, there's a bumpy road, you know, um, that you learn so much from the things that don't go your way. And the other ones that might have a like fluid life in academy football and go all the way, they struggle. Then you know when it when it when the adversity and the difficult moments hit, I went through a lot, injury, doubting myself, but always staying realistic because I always said almost like don't focus on that, don't worry about it, just do what you you know, do what you like and see how far it takes you. So you know especially then. 15, 16, where I struggled a lot, you know, with that, with injuries. And then actually understanding it, you know, when you stick to something and you're really passionate about something, some stage, you, you're going to grow and develop, you know, you, you make that step then. So, you know, writing off people, you know, is, is quite difficult. Even for me now, what I'm now doing is it's quite difficult for me because I've had such a, journey you know into the first team and all of a sudden you are then 17 18 and just make the right steps at the right time the ones who were early matured much more talented all of a sudden you can keep up with them and that affected something in me to you know now i've got a chance but i keep doing what i'm doing i keep keep being really good at school school trying to earn my grades there so it, it all clicked for me so you know in my last under 19 year <clears throat> under 19 in Germany then you know the we, we went far for 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 the German kind of um cup for the German championship actually and first team manager was watching which was Ralph Rani at that time you know who had a lot of spells you know with our RB and Man United even lately he then watched the game and offered me a place in the in preseason tour so that was kind of my entry point that I wasn't really fussed about who was watching me. I always felt like in important moments, I was just there and ready to perform. So I think for a lot of youngsters, that journey between the age of 12, 13 to actually 17, 18 is so important, you know? Yeah. And you just can't just take it for granted. I'm, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be professional. I think you need to stick to the process, enjoy it as much as you can, and just try to improve every single day. And even if that means sometimes you, you might n- not be able to improve, you know, because you can't play because you're injured, but this teaches you so much. So taking advantage of that is, is crucial. And that really helped me to find my way into that space where I was just ready to perform and use an opportunity. Do you think that experience enables you to be uh, successful in your current role at Arsenal now obviously dealing with players that might be going through similar experiences do you feel like there's a bit of a link there between your time and, and your profession now yeah I'm trying to reiterate everyone is unique in their in their pathway and I have, I have to kind of acknowledge and you know everyone has to accept that but obviously you you, you work off experiences you know that that might help you to guide I'm, I'm not there to say no oh this is the way I'm just trying to you know cushion a bit you know making sure that whenever we release someone at that age I just bring that across you know this is not the end that doesn't define you neither you as a as a footballer nor as a person you know I always come back to you know we have to make sure we provide them you know with with a challenging environment but as well when when it comes to shove just to make sure that they know where they stand with us and sometimes 
a release might be the best thing for them, you know, to grow and develop in a different environment. So I'm always trying to keep it really balanced, you know. Don't believe it, the hype as much because I've seen hype players, you know, being completely burned out, you know, by the intention and everything that brings to it. And that's why I struggle to say, oh, who's the next one? Who's the next one in the academy? I don't know. I, I absolutely don't know. And, um, you know, everyone has got so many opinions, but just for thrown out names, that is that is too easy for me. And it makes it, could make it difficult for someone that might struggle with that. So we're trying to provide an environment, yeah, that, that puts players, you know, in certain situations, but we are also there when it, when it doesn't work out. So sometimes the caring thing is then to release someone or really take care of someone in terms of, you know, showing them the, a way and giving them our experiences of, you know, kind of what's most sustainable in this, in this phase, because we have seen so many players going different routes, different ways into their successful life. Just reflecting on your playing career then, Hanover and then Werder Brennan, what was the biggest piece of advice you received during that, that transition? Or even maybe you mentioned your father and getting the opportunity and seeking the opportunity. Is there anything that stands out during that time? Earning respect stands out for me because... At that time, I was then in a, in a dressing room, an environment where you just had to put your head down, you know, because at that day, at that age, it was more like, you know, I was seen as a rival, young players seen as a rival, you know, for the senior experienced players and sitting in the dressing room and just putting your head down, not saying anything because you could, you could look someone in the eye and, you know, people would be offended or oh, what do you want from me? You, you have to sometimes just make sure when you haven't done anything for anyone, right? You just make sure you got to go step by step and really make sure you can help the team on the pitch. That that was the focus of me. You know, I, I was never seen to, you know, I, I would go really step by step, earning the respect, you know, of, of the players that, has, that have been there for a long time. That was big for me. And I think... There's a, there's a small margin between having a good training session, you know, and really then, you know, the arrogance coming out, you know, I think the consistency there of, of proving yourself day in, day out until you're trusted, you know, one training session doesn't, doesn't make a difference sometimes. It's just the accumulation of things you, you do, you do right. Um, you are on time all, you know, it's just. The, the the month that I was persistent with this is is a lesson that and nowadays everyone wants to you know grow oh I've done this now now I need to go to the next stage I need to I need to get promoted now I've done this I need to play now work your way up you know and sometimes it's there there, there are steps to it you know to be rewarded and I think that is something that um, I quickly learned but I was ready for it because of the of the way of my upbringing the obstacles in the way. I was naturally patient and I wanted to earn it properly instead of getting thrown in a mix and just, you know, changing my, my personality. I was I was ready to, to to wait for the right moment and, and my opportunity came. Just on that then, so you mentioned your uh, characteristics in terms of being professional and leadership within yeah. maybe your captaincy at Bremen as well as Arsenal. Things stand out in terms of your leadership that you think you were good at in terms of inspiring others and motivating others as well. Yeah, I think reliability is is big. Is big, very simple, but big because I was always seen, and no matter where I went, I was always seen in that bracket of uh, he can take responsibility. You know, at some stage he can be in a position where he's captain material or he's the one who takes care of the fines or it's just. Just based on simple facts of reliability, being there, being honest, you know, I, I would say things, you know, I would, I would, I would command trying to make sure I communicate well in training, always respectfully. But these were the simple traits that got me always in a position. Obviously, being a centre back, you always have the best possible overview. My size, my body, like um, the education background, it's just, you know, kept me, you know really there where I wanted to be, you know, and then coaches were looking at me and thinking, yeah, he brings 
seven out of ten like all the time you know it was like seven out of ten all the time this consistency across the board you know that level i was never uh let, let's say 10 out of 10 you know never seen to be i was always a seven because i would break down the simple stuff win my dude pass it to the next person you know set the right header back to the to the right person never lose the ball never you know minimum mistakes this were the kind of principles i looked at first and foremost not how much we kind of played out from the back and how sophisticated we were it just i broke it down to the simple stuff and being really reliable with it got me in positions where after two years time oh here's here's the armband or oh, here's you take care of this because I, I found out, you know, the more you kind of in that bracket of doing things the right way, doing things properly, doing things reliable on time, just got me in a better place everywhere I went. So, yeah, I, I think, and that just, it just grows trust within teammates, within coaches, and then they'll give you more responsibility, whatever that means. What about those that are not, aligning with your standards and per so you've got standards for yourself and you want to be reliable and consistent and do the basics correctly and consistently what happens if those are not matching that what kind of leadership approach do you use then um i think i'm uh, uh, you know i'm quite adaptable i, I want to have fun you know i'm not like just super serious but i think there's foundation for me you know these standards are the foundations you know to enjoy and have fun you know this is this is kind of really non-negotiable but i will i will show i will action i will be one of the first on the pitch i will then command demand you know in a certain way and sometimes you feel that people like or didn't like it but people then you know you you make sure you just you know trying to be as much on the same page as possible so i would be on them but if it really works for everyone that's where you enjoy that's where you you enjoy the hard work you enjoy the the consistency this is where you get successful that's where you get into that bracket where it goes from building real standard foundations to then you know enjoy it have fun everyone on the same page this is what is about successful teams you know and this is what was for me about leadership consistently behaving in a way where you know i would bring something you know to a team by bettering myself all the time and if someone doesn't do it i'm 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 there to support i'm there to help but learning is key learning is key if if you want to be part of that you're welcome and you can make a mistake once well don't do it twice you know that's that's where it kind of got me and that's how i learned you know once is fine but you need to see some some learning and, and reflecting otherwise it, it doesn't work in a team so um yeah I'm, there are many ways but first and foremost i i, I want to enjoy i want to enjoy but doing the right things all the time and and people to come along that way because people recognize that will bring us you know collective success so just on that then so you said learning is key how did you adapt to the Premier League then so obviously getting your move to Arsenal how did you learn and adapt to the different environment and different league etc yeah I was uh, 26 26 nearly 27 I think I had like over 70 caps for Germany that time was an experienced Bundesliga player uh, Arsene Wenger called me it's kind of if, if you're a professional player uh, the dream move then is to go to the Premier League best league in the world and first year, I, I I struggled big time, you know, different tempo, different transition. There is, is more physical. The 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 Premier League is on a on a different level, you know, on those markers. And um, yeah, I was allowed to make mistakes, which is which is brilliant, right? And Arsene Wenger would reiterate, you're intelligent enough, you would learn, you will do this, you'll do that, and um, you know, he gave me the time basically, you know, to adapt. I think. Probably when I when I came 2011, I think my best season 2014 2015, the, the 2015 16. So it, it kind of almost took me three years, you know, to then peak again and to develop again. What I then did as well is training regime. You know, the technical level was at higher. Um, I needed to adapt and really 
immerse myself with the the, the training regime of of Arsene and his stuff. You know, I think technique execution. I really needed to go a level higher. You know, the physicality. I needed to make quicker decisions. It's just that process took me such a long time, but I was just so grateful for all the experiences that these coaches gave me and the belief in me to, you know, uh, to be trusted because I had to suffer first, you know, to really understand. And then it's great to have teammates who recognize that you really want to develop and grow. Um, and I just showed everyone, yeah, uh, off the pitch, uh, I wanted to be like a top professional that, that, you know, could earn the kind of the next step on the pitch. So that comes with it, with it, that you have to, when you suffer, you have to, you have to stay humble all the time, you know, and even being a like German international, you know, that going the next step, you need to earn it again. It is, it's always like earn your respect again, because you go to a different club, different culture. You're, you're written off again after a couple of months. I just, I, I was so happy that I got the opportunity to really prove myself over years. Uh, but and that's not, that's not a given, uh, but you have to immerse yourself with the culture, learn the language, command, um, be there on time or, you know, everywhere, like trying to make a positive impact because the club was, was, is so big and, and, and working towards something bigger really, really helped me to stay humble and, you know, go with it. Even I was like a pro at that time for eight years. How did Arsene Wenger support you then? So you, you mentioned the word adaptability culturally, but also playing as well. Obviously, the, the centre-back role has changed probably since when you started. So obviously, you mentioned the word playing out from the back, et cetera, and all those different facets that have changed. What did Wenger do to support you within that transition? Um, I think uh, I, I learned a lot of stuff from him in terms of yeah, the, the culture, the training ground, so much different to the German model. You know, you are so much more isolated here from the from the from the fans. You just meet the fans on match day. That's it. And they want to see what you've worked on. They don't want to see the work. They, they want to see basically that you have worked hard to get to where you are and bring it your all. So the relationship with the fans is different. In Bremen, they would come to every training session and watch. At Arsenal, it was almost like a shock for me not to see any fans you know, at training. So you could really, you know, ingrain with the process, learn, develop. Arsene Wenger loved that, that environment. Quiet, nice. We can really work here together, you know, to adapt to the process. You know, I, I mean, I joined when <clears throat> Arsenal lost 8-2 to Man, Man United. That was the, the window when all of a sudden like seven, eight players came. Mikel Arteta, uh, Arteta came, myself came and I was thinking, boy, the training ground must be like almost burned, but no one was here. Like no one was here. We could just work on patterns. We could work on really quietly, be super professional, go in, do recovery, eat, go to my car, drive home. I thought it was so a, a, a totally different environment that I think Arsene Wenger takes advantage of. You know, what, whatever happens, you know, on the pitch always was a rock, always back in us. On the field, calm, collected, you know, always trusting the players, giving them time, giving them space to develop themselves, giving them an opportunity to express themselves freely without any kind of influence from the outside. It was brilliant to see and it, and it works, you know, and it works and he created that environment to give players like Theo Walcott, Alex Oxlade chamberlain like a platform to develop and grow and just, you know, like go one-on-one five, six, seven times, you know, like into a one-on-one -on -one situation where I think as, you know, as, as a German, I would say, you got to stop it now. You got to make sure that they understand that there's other options sometimes. Just go one-on-one. -on -one. But it just would let it flow, let it go. Would players give the freedom for them to find their decision? Um, similar with me. Yeah, he, he would prompt me. They said, you, you got to level up here, you know. It's quicker here, it's faster. People get onto you. You lose the ball quicker. You know, constantly making sure I was aware of my flaws. And then in training, I was just ready to, to just level up, you know, and, and make sure that he understands that I was working on these frames on technical execution, but making quicker and better decisions out of the back. And he loved, for example, and he would, he would praise certain situations where you then would know, I need to nail this in training. Like, 
if if a cross would come in and I was able to take a touch, play out safely from the back instead of booting the ball into the stands. He would love that. He would make sure every time I would do it, he would praise it in the right kind of moment to make sure that I understood, okay, in order to do that next time, obviously you need to be in the best possible position to do that, to take another touch to play out from the back instead of booting it, losing the ball again. We were all around. How can we get the ball down as quickly as possible? Because we'll be exposed to you know, long balls, Fred in behind. How can I make sure I had the ball to the right person? How can I make sure I bring the ball down with my chest, you know, and put it down, you know, to play out and, and play safely? These were the themes constantly reiterated for me in training um, to put into practice, put into the games and really find my way, you know, in English football. And that was that was tough, but the Arsene Wenger create an environment where you get given time. We have no time, you know? Because it was always we need to we need to come in the Champions League we need to do this we need to do that we need to win titles we need to do but well, it felt almost I've got time here to develop. It's, it's really interesting how you mention the different models between Germany and England and that training ground environment. Obviously, you mentioned the A2 defeat to Man United, and you probably will be aware of you know the Arsenal fan TV and the Wengerite protests and everything that was kind of surrounding that period. Um, of uh, of Arsenal's kind of uh, journey uh, uh, in in the in the Premier League, did that not impact you at all? Did that not ever impact the the players at all? Because obviously, I think there was a bit of a, uh, a dry sprout in terms of winning trophies and, and winning the league, etc. It must have had some impact, right? Uh, ten years, ten years, ten years. When we then won it in twenty fourteen, the FA Cup. That was after the invincible season. Obviously, that was the first trophy. So. When I came, that was three years beforehand. Yeah, you got a sense for that. But the 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 funny thing when Arsene Wenger called me, he called me, you know, he called me, spoke to me in German. I was like super impressed. He said, "Yeah, we want you to bring like literally some leadership into the team." And without really knowing what that meant, I thought, okay, you know, as he means that I should, you know, take responsibility. And that was that was. That is responsibility, you know, in terms of getting to, to know him a bit better and understanding it. You feel like you, you, you need to give back here, you know. And that's a lot, I think a lot of players were in that mode of Arsene Wenger really believes in me. He gives me the trust, gives me the time. I need to I need to give back to the club to, and to Arsene himself. You know, I think he created a lot of that stuff. So whatever happens on the outside, he almost no matter how heated the discussion was, it never felt on the inside. It's crazy to say that because I think if you have got a young team, a developing team, you kind of need that. There was never a sense for him like rushing us. I think he understood the players really well. Um, you could argue that, yeah, probably we were not ruthless enough. You know, sometimes you you probably need that, but it, it was just not the style and, and the environment that was, that was there for. So he always kept protecting top four. That was kind of, you know, that was his go-to top four, which is quite difficult to achieve, right? You know, yeah, I think he he was the one basically, um, you know, protecting us pretty much. So he created an environment where you wanted to give, you know, him back, you know, and the club back. And top four, as I said, was his absolute priority, you know, to, to secure that, to, you know, to keep building the club with the new stadium. I think it was a remarkable kind of achievement that, Looking back to it, it was, yeah, it, it was big with the resources he had, with the amount of people that you know the best players that went on. We were in that kind of section where it was it was quite difficult to come back to winning ways in terms of trophies. Obviously, during that period, you had Meza Özil, Podolski, Gnabry, a bit of a German consortium to some extent. Did that help you settle with with those players around you just to? To protect you in that sense, I think I helped them to settle. Basically, <laughs> I, when I came, um, I, I was pretty independent. I would say I, I would have, I, I was pretty good in kind of developing quickly, understanding, you know, about the culture, about the the language. Um, but then, yeah, Mezu, uh, Poldi, uh, um, and Serge Gnabry come in. You know, from the youth ranks, you could see, uh, yeah, that it's an ambitious club. We're trying to immerse from, you know, not winning 10 years to to the club that gets closer and closer and closer. So, 
you know, these little cliques that every club has got, right? You know, we had an, Eng an English core group. We've got French connection. We've got kind, kind of an international table, Spanish, German. We had uh, Santi Cazola. We had Nacho Monreal. We had Alexis Sanchez. You know, we've, we've, you know, naturally you separate yourself a bit, but it never felt that way. Like in general in the dressing room, I think we were all together and whoever it was, English, French, German, Spanish at that time. Um, we, we had a good team and we had a good team and what we've tried to do always. And it was with Pauli and Mesut and Serge. Yeah, I, I, probably I, I could hold them a bit more accountable, you know, because of our kind of history as German internationals. Uh, um, we, we have been through a lot of stuff together, you know, very successfully. So now we, we had we had good times together and Serge Gnabry with a young player. Sh like, that was probably showing him the way was the only way basically you know to become a professional player um was probably a, a big thing as well and yeah unfortunately for us he didn't unlock his potential here but i think he had to go somewhere else you know to do it um which is unfortunate for arsenal but i'm, I'm really happy for him personally we'll talk about the german national team in a moment but i just want to ask you um in terms of the players that you played with, you mentioned Mikel Arteta and obviously being the manager of Arsenal currently at the moment. Did you notice that management and leadership whilst playing with him? Or is it something that maybe evolved after football? I'm intrigued on that. No, I, I got that straight away. That he was... No, no, I, I didn't look at, oh, he's going to be a coach in the future. I didn't look at that. I, I looked at his reassurance take, take and taking responsibility from day one for whatever the the team will deliver he felt responsible you know and then you get a sense for you know yeah he he means it he gives everything for it so i i saw he he is he, he felt responsibility from day one and i could um grow alongside him because he was very experienced you know in in terms of english game and he was at that age where he was almost like yeah, he's going to be captain in the future. He's going to be the next one anyway. And I will have an opportunity to learn and grow with him. That's what I've focused on, you know? So him role modeling and me learning from it, that was more important. Um, yeah, looking back, obviously, you could make that link of, you know, him seeing what was going on. You kind of get linked to Arsenal. He wants to bring Arsenal to where it belongs, winning titles. That's, that's, his, that's his focus. That's his focus on. And I could see that responsibility from day one when we met in a hotel together and he took me because I couldn't drive on the on on the wrong side of the road. So he took me like every day from from the hotel to the training. So we bonded quite quickly because of the circumstances that we came together. On your leadership then, and you mentioned there was a bit of a drought in terms of Arsenal winning trophies in 2014. There was the FA Cup final and uh, then there was kind of back-to-back -back success in, in the FA Cup final. Um, what was your kind of approach going into those final in, into that final? And I remember rightly, you were 2-0 down at one point against Hull City. And what was kind of the mindset at half-time like? I'm just intrigued about the overall environment. <laughs> yeah, I think there was some form of pressure before the game. In general, we felt quite good about Wembley. Or me as well. I, I felt quite good about Wembley. Obviously, we had the semi-final. We had kind of an easy run to the, you know, to the final as well. And it was, let's say, just how. I mean, it was reality check for us, really. After 20 minutes, almost 3-0 down. Um, there was a certain element of trust in our team that we would, you know, if it would get going, we would get into a rhythm. We had players like Santi Cazola who could change any second, like, you almost had a bit of trust, but we needed to get rid of that first shock. You know, we're, we're, we're playing Hull City in the final. How lucky are we? Ten years, not no title. So there was a bit of pressure on it. But we were 2 nil down, shook it off first, and then we always looked towards players that can make the difference, i.e. Santi Cazola, i.e. a player like Aaron Rams. You know, we had the difference makers, you know, who could turn a, a, a final into, you know, into a win. So 
I think once we got into the game, I think we deserve to be on top. And I think that was really important. There was a big relief, you know, for, most, first and foremost for us and Wenger that we could continue kind of the story and, and winning a title. Um, and I think the FA Cup got us something, you know, especially, you know, with a, like three titles in four years. That's not easy to achieve, you know. You can, you can, you can really say, yeah, we, in that spell, you know, still to this day, no, no, no title, no league title. Fair play, you know. I'll take it. I think we weren't good enough, you know, consistent enough. But at least for six games, you know, we, you know, we we got that done three times in four years, and that is can only be down to still that we had a good and successful team and a manager that believed in us and a team that believed in the manager and the strength and the environment he created. So, yeah, looking back to it, 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 it we we are, I think we are still proud. And the first one was probably the most difficult one in terms of getting over that hump that we're still able to, as a team, to win something. You mentioned the league and not being successful to, to go on and, and win it. What, what do you think the missing ingredient was? <clears throat> I mentioned consistency. I think overall we were not consistent and good enough at, at times. You know, and when you look back, we, we, we finished second when Leicester won it. You know, what a, what a missed opportunity for us as we won against them twice in that season but they were absolutely unbelievable against all the other top teams. I think they lost three games that season. So, got to give them credit. I think, ultimately, we weren't at the level required, you know, to, to, to win a trophy, 38 games. When you lose seven or eight games, that, that was kind of our ratio every single season. Like, you have, you've got no chance. So, if you lose more than five games, you're not, you're not a contender. And we always lost that amount of games. Um, by not performing when it really matters, um, when it really mattered. So that goes down to, you know, the quality at the end of the players and, and reiterating and repeating it, um, which will, which is a shame. You know, I think we had opportunities, but what we often did was just finish in third, finish in fourth on the last game of the season in Newcastle. So we had a lot of moments, actually, where we still secured fourth, third, second, like in, on the last match day. There was a season where went to a White Hart Lane, um, lost a game, 10 games to go. I think they were ahead of us, six points. And then we had a run like 27 points out of 30, I think, in the last 10 games. I, I, we, we had spells where we were unbelievable, unbelievable runs. But overall, the whole season, we never unfolded to have that quality over the whole season. Was Finger strategic around kind of the, the season? Would he kind of pinpoint certain points at certain times and how the season would play out? I'm just intrigued on the kind of the overlook towards a Premier League season and how that aligns with you as players. Yeah. I mean, December month was always critical, right? I mean, the December month is just, it's just crazy. You know, if you come from abroad and go to England, you just, you cannot believe that there are eight games packed, you know, in December. And it was almost felt like, you know, these, in the Premier League, you always felt like <laughs> you can't slip up. If you slip up, if you, if you go like momentum a bit down, you've got two free games in succession, like so quickly. If the momentum goes, you, you're almost like out of the title race straight away. So it's like pinpointing like these, how important the next game was and you know naturally you just feel sometimes especially in december like and everyone like faces you and thinking we're gonna we're gonna give arsenal a hard time they just want to play we're just going to be a bit physical and that that will do them so yeah it is so tough you know to go to go strong every single month you know every single month to, to keep that consistency we're never able to do that and if, if you look at the, the clubs who have got momentum and have got like people who can step in, like almost having two sorts of 11s ready now, you know, whenever something happens to step in and just make the difference for, for the team. Um, I think we, were, we weren't that team consistent enough to understand in like moments of momentum and how quickly it can shift. You said it was so tough. Who is the toughest striker you, you played against? Does anyone stand out? I think Aguero was always tough. Fernando Torres, um, 
these were the players I looked towards to. They were overall the best I've seen. Torres, I would compare to a Lewandowski, like complete player, strong, header, left foot, right foot, um, composed on the ball, quick. Aguero was just his center of gravity was just, I don't know, at toe level for me. It was just, but his legs were so strong, you couldn't really grab him. You know, these were top class strikers. You know, you almost needed to have support all the time constantly, you know, to go one-on-one -on -one with them, which a lot of def central defenders do now, right? One-on-one -on -one in the back line, defending four. That, that would have been super tough. So I think these two I would highlight in my, in my time here. Just on Germany then, Per. So obviously World Cup success in 2014. Um, obviously, living in England, you've noticed that we're crying out for a World Cup win and there's always that belief that England could go on and win it but never seem to do it, especially in my lifetime. What do you think the key element is to win a World Cup? Is there anything that, on reflection of that period, it stands out that was the, the kind of key factor that enabled you to win it? I think England is, is, is on a good way. You just got to trust the process. With with Germany, we had from 2006 until 2014, we had like five major tournaments to play until we won something. Five major tournaments where young players were, were trusted. You know, 2006, that was kind of... Um, Jürgen Klinsmann came in and said, listen, these five come in. Philipp Lahm, Podolski, Schweinsteiger, myself. At that time, it was Thomas Hilsitzberger as well. Like kind of five players coming into the scenes, 21, 22, ready to grow, ready to give time. Confed Cup 2006 um, to play, then play the home World Cup, finish in third. Then 2008, finish in second. 2010, finish in third again. 2012, semi final again. And then winning it. You know, so, so we went through a cycle of where we had steps, small steps and successes where we just kept going and thinking we're going to grow our experience, the core will stay, we'll stick together. We just add bits and pieces that will complement a, a, a team ethos. Because that's really difficult, right? 23 players go into the tournament at some stage, 11 will play, 12 will be disappointed. How you keep that energy growing within the team that everyone has got a role to play? Everyone has got to respect the decision of the manager, but trying to give everything to convince him, you know, to, to put me in next time. So the, the team dynamic is so crucial in a World Cup. Oh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't highlight it more that there's so many, you know, difficult scenarios. You've got to have a good selection of group together. They understand their role and execute it to, to an extent. I mean, on the individual basis, yeah, we have like good players. Don't get me wrong especially in 2014. But when it mattered, we were just a stronger, the, 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 just a stronger team mentally, physically, but then as well executing like semi-final against Brazil. I think we had five chances first half, five nil, bang, 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 bang. It was just the, the German way of being really efficient, you know, with everything we did. But that came from a group that was really, really efficient. You know, how we kind of treated each other, how we trained with each other, how we overcame obstacles from the media world, from the outside world, from within. Uh, we, had, we had a fantastic group of players that, with a lot of experiences, with a lot of tough experiences, you know, with a lot of semifinals that led to the 2014 and kind of the pinnacle, like the top of the mountain where we just, it was just meant to be. I think we just deserved it in the final against Argentina. You could argue they were the better team, had the better chances, they couldn't execute. We had that one chance. Mario Götze just executed it. That's it. That's the story. But I think the journey started in probably 2004 after we got knocked out in the Euros. That 10-year cycle of like steps to that success. And I think if you compare that to England, where if you got like three, four tournaments, similar-ish, semi-final, final, Euros, um, I think you're on a strong journey there as well. And if I compare it, that's what we ha had to experience to be, you know, on top of the world. And and the feeling is brilliant. But now, but on reflecting back, there is there's a lot 
around the team that needs to get solved and sometimes selection of is 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 key and i think we had the right people sitting in the right seats on on that bus towards brazil you said one of your values was not to kind of get carried away and keep loyal to working hard and, and trying to keep consistent obviously during that world cup germany beat brazil 7-0 and they're the holders they're the they're the ones 7-1 seven, seven, one. One. <laughs> yeah um so, uh how do you how do you kind of regroup after that and go okay we need to kind of keep our feet on the floor and and go again? We knew after the game, or oh, the next one is the most difficult one. That was that was our mindset straight away. We're never gonna play a game like this. We almost peaked too early, you know, in the World Cup um, because we had a terrible game against Algeria, where we got an extra time, got through, faced France. When it one nil, one o'clock, it was hot. But the first first team to score would go through, and then Brazil was just. I mean, we were all kind of anxious because you know it was in Brazil. We knew we had to now beat the South American teams. You know, we had to 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 deserve it. We had to beat the South American teams. No team has ever done it before. There was a there was a big burden on us, really. Um, and and after the Brazil game, because. From the outside, Brazil was so excited. Then were shocked. Then they were disappointed, and then they were angry. Like the fans, like the whole turnaround of that was just like it was. It was terrible for them, but it was amazing to watch. You know how the how it all unfolded. But after that game, you know we enjoyed it. I mean, even at halftime, with five 0 up at halftime, everyone was buzzing, like in the in the dressing room, like buzzing, like everyone was up being yeah, 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 whatever coach came in hammered us bang shut up everyone sit down like it's not over we're gonna we're gonna do this 90 minutes bang 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 so these were the kind of messages even at halftime after the game I think because normally in a semi-final you've got this last gas winner or penalties where everyone like runs onto the pitch like whoa that time like we were almost like mm, it's awkward for them we're almost like I think we we felt sorry for them, you know. So the big hoo ha wasn't there really, you know. It was it was so weird. So we celebrated a bit with the fans at the end of it, but then the focus was we have peaked now. We we gotta we gotta focus, concentrate on 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 the final game, which will be the most difficult one. And a sense of relief them winning it, I presume. Um, yeah, I think so. As I said, it was kind of meant to be, you know, with all the experiences and 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 the team, what we have gone through. I think we, we deserved it on that regard. Not maybe on the game, but they couldn't score. Just couldn't score. It was just a. Sometimes there's there's a higher sense for something, and I thought they, they just couldn't score. And then, yeah, th- these are the moments you want to prolong a bit. You know, you want to get. I mean, w- we had a good time then. I mean, almost like the original World Cup gets taken away from you after what ten minutes. It's like it's like weird, weird scenarios. What happens then in the dressing room? But you, you want to keep those moments. For me, the moment was probably sitting next to Philip Lam. You know, in the you you, you are you're exhausted there in the dressing room and thinking, yeah, what well, well, you know, what's next? You know, what's next for us? You know, I think kind of reflecting on the ten years being in the national team, having o- over hundred caps, both of what we say, yeah. This is it. It can't get any better. You know, you have to, you have to let others, you know, have an opportunity now to play, you know, at the highest level. So these kind of the, the, the moments that I really embrace and really um, look back and thinking, yeah, yeah, brilliant. You know, some of the decisions that we took along the way, but then it was a relief. You're right. It was a relief. Will the golden generation win something? Yes or no? It, it kind of, you, you never want to be like, defined just on footballing success but that's what that was a defining moment that that tournament it was a defining moment for that team being together for such a long time the core being together for such a long time not winning anything it would be de- it it would it would have been not very nice so we could really really enjoy it you know together with the fans because once we finished third, second, third. We always went back to Germany and celebrated a bit, which we got a lot of criticism for. A lot of criticism. We can only celebrate when we win something. We went back the next day after a long night uh, of celebration back to Berlin, like 
one million people, you know, on the streets. It was, it was brilliant. The only downfall of that is celebrate the next day and then you knew you, you have to go on holiday quickly because preseason's already started. It was mid, it's mid July then, right? It's mid July where, you know, the other teams already starting preseason and yeah, you've only three weeks now. What you really want to do is basically go together somewhere, enjoy it, reflect, and just just do something together. We we didn't have time for that. And next year we're gonna do something together because it's ten years, which I'm looking forward to seeing everyone back. Excellent. So final segment of the podcast, Per. I just wanna ask you around in terms of what we spoke about and just on reflection on what you've kind of elaborated on today. How does that make you a better academy manager today, Arsenal? What things make you, from your experiences, successful within what you do today? Um, I think I think I really um, enjoyed a journey, a bumpy road into professional football, and never I think never for, never forgotten where where I come from, who I am, what what I stand for. And that consistency I want to bring, you know, to the club because Arsene Wenger, who saw me grow for seven years at this club, said to me, listen, I-, I want you to stay at the club. I want you to take over the academy. I want you to challenge the youngsters and their mentality um, going forward. So that that is huge responsibility for me and gives me a sense for not only belonging, you know, but a sense of pride and, and responsibility to take on the next generation of players and make them better people and, and keep that balanced view of not so much believing the hype all the time, but keep growing and creating gaps for yourself. You know, where can you improve? What do I need to do better? Where can I work on my reliability and consistency? That that's that's all I'm asking for. Standards will for for, for me the only way are, you know, if you have high standards, it will get you far. You know, in life, in your professional career, whatever you want to achieve, this is what I'm constantly every day trying to work on, role model, show action and stay really persistent with it i think you know my whole career and how i was deemed to be successful just the whole foundation i built over the years and with with the help of my parents friends schoolmates teachers um coaches like family uncles aunties everyone it's just i just want to continue um and, and grow with it and you know, that that's what I'm doing at home with my wife, kids, everyone, the Arsenal Academy, the staff, just create a sense for everyone belongs here and we're trying to make everyone better every single day. But not forget that we enjoy it, have fun because we build on those foundations. So I think <clears throat> when I look back, I think Arsene Wenger has seen me seven years, you know, being consistent. And he said, listen, that will be, that, that was basically my interview, right? And that's where... That's why it's so important, you know, even when no one is watching, do the right things. You will benefit and people and mentors and coaches will see that in you and will put you in the next kind of position for you to grow and develop and do something meaningful. So uh, I believe everyone has got a chance to do that. And on that, and final question, how would you like to be remembered, Per? Um, the BFG, innit? I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just... Um, I just, I just want that, you know, wherever I was, I just, you know, when I leave at one stage that people, you know, think that he was a good guy and, you know, that someone really benefited from me and I treated people well, just when, when I leave one day, they will hopefully not come. I don't know. I I, I just want to feel that, you know, I had, I had a positive impact on, on other people. That's that was that that's kind of what i feel is, is is in my dna that's what i got got taught that's how people that brought me up i just want to feel all those shoes that really put me in those positions but i just want to say thank you for your time obviously speaking with you for the the last well 50 minutes you seem a very yeah. humble and, <laughs> and caring blokes thank and you. i just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you and uh good luck in the future with at Arsenal and obviously your future plans as well. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.